do you think the world is going to be recognizable 10 years from now in 2035? I mean, in the sense that like the continents will exist, yes. <laughs> uh, but but in terms of the superstructure, like societal layer above it, I think very few institutions that predated the internet will survive the internet. So that's Balaji, former Coinbase CTO and author of The Network State. And what he's basically saying here is that just like how the internet wiped out pre-internet institutions, AI is going to do the same to pre-AI institutions which are the ones we rely on today. This is a bold claim, and one that Pierre Diamandis and his co-hosts Dave Blunden and Salim Ismail don't fully buy into. Over the next hour or so, they challenge Balaji on what this really means, not just for society at large, but for individuals like you and me. And as you'd expect from a Moonshots podcast episode, the discussion gets fascinating fast. From why China may have already won the AI race, to whether we'll end up with one digital god or a swarm of competing AGIs, to the question that probably matters most, is your job safe? Here were the best moments. Let's get into it. All right, so first up, here's Balaji's full breakdown of why he thinks AI is going to completely reshape society by 2035. You've probably heard claims like this before, that AI will be bigger than the internet, maybe even bigger than the advent of electricity, but the way he frames it here, using the internet as an analogy, is a really useful way to think about what's coming. Take a look. I mean, in the sense that like the continents will exist, yes. <laughs> uh, but, but in terms of the superstructure, like societal layer above it, I think very few institutions that predated the internet will survive the internet. And I, I look at it as this, it's in a sense, the single most important force in the world yet still underestimated. It's like, it's upstream of AI, it's upstream of crypto, in a real sense, upstream of China, upstream of robotics, upstream of what we're doing right now. It's in front of your face when you wake up and it's on your watch when you go to sleep. And it's yet, it's in front of politics. You know, Twitter elected Trump and Twitter deplatformed Trump and then X re-elected Trump. And, and that happened in every other country. Twitter caused Brexit and Twitter, you know, caused every political fracas we've seen. And that's just like one rivulet of the internet. And so, so yeah, I think the world is going to be radically, radically different. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, you guys, you know, we're, you guys are maybe some, a little bit older than me, but I think kind of the world was relatively static from 1980 to 2015 or so. And then it really started changing quite rapidly over the last 10 years. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Well, I had, I had Ray Kurzweil on our stage at the Abundance Summit, and he said, we're going to see as much change between now and 2035 as we saw between 1925 and 2025, a century's worth of progress. I think and, that's right. Yeah. So if you think about your daily life right now and compare it to 20 years ago or even just 5 to 10, you'll quickly realize that everything is now underpinned by the internet. Communication, entertainment, finance, even politics. All of it now flows through the net. And that's the point Balaji's making. Just like the internet became the foundation for everything, AI is about to sit on top of that and do the same. But that raises the big question, who actually controls this future? The supply chains, the infrastructure, the compute. Here's Balaji's take, and surprisingly, he argues the US has already lost. Check this out. So first is, uh, China's demographic problems have robotic solutions. And the thing is that, why did the South lose the Civil War? Because the North industrialized, the North didn't have slave labor. And many times, if you look, societies that have lots of, for example, illegal aliens aren't slaves, but they're often paid you know, under table wages and so on and so forth, they're exploited in different ways. If you have a society that's got an abundance of, quote, cheap labor, it often fails to industrialize, fa fails to automate. And China is using its kind of demographic pressure to automate, 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 automate as like a 1% shock every year to force them to automate. If you've ever been to China, like it's it's already ahead on that kind of thing. They already have the delivery drones, they have the hotel robots, they have all of that kind of stuff. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two is if you actually look at other metrics besides dollars, one of the issues is dollars are controlled by the US government. And so you have to actually look at 
physical production. China, for example, has you know one shipyard, as the U.S. Secretary of the Navy, Carlos Del Toro said, produces more ships than the entire U.S. Navy combined. Hegseth, who's the current Secretary of Defense, has said Chinese hypersonics can sink all U.S. aircraft carriers. The Raytheon CEO has said that the U.S. can't decouple from China. And there's a Govini study that was commissioned by the Pentagon, $400 million study, that basically showed the U.S. military is made in China. If you go and look at the Tomahawk or the JDAM, the famous American weapons, their supplier supplier are all Chinese factory. So the, the the war is actually already over. It's actually already been lost because China can just hit a button and just shut off supply chain, right? That's why what's going on with the rare earth elements and so on and so forth. This is something that the, in a sense, the war was fought with the trade war in 2015 and the U.S. lost because what China did is it diversified its revenue streams outside of the West. Only 15% of its revenue comes from the U.S. 85% comes from non-U.S. sources. So even if the tariffs chopped it in half, they still got 90, 95% of their, their revenue left. And so um, I think that even the chip ban, for example, challenging the Chinese to a test of quantum mechanics and like semiconductor production when all four you know, the major chip companies, you know, look, can the Chinese as a culture, can they do chip making? Of course, it's like challenging the Italians to a pizza making contest. And so, you know, this was like, this was right in their wheelhouse, like do math and computer science and manufacturing for national pride and Chinese sovereignty, right? So being Italian myself, I can definitely confirm the pizza thing. And yes, he's probably right about the Chinese being generally better at math and science too. But in all seriousness, the only thing really stopping China from achieving AI supremacy is the lack of their own NVIDIA. They don't have a company yet that can build GPUs as powerful and efficient. And honestly, who does? I mean, even the US doesn't. There's only one NVIDIA. The thing is though, China has everything else. They have the cheap labor, they have the massive energy capacity, and they have the manufacturing scale. Not for chip specialization yet, but it's really only a matter of time. And while the US export controls are definitely working, China is certainly struggling to secure NVIDIA GPUs. And as a result, DeepSeek's next generation reasoning model R2 has been delayed several times now by months. But China is also now tripling down on chip fabrication. And if they do catch up, again, they already have the abundant labor, energy, and dark factories to scale way past the US in the long run. And don't forget TSMC, they make over 90% of the world's advanced chips, and at least geographically, they're a lot closer to China than to the US. By the way, I'm actually putting together a full course on this exact topic, breaking down the core components of AI, the industries it depends on, and which areas stand to benefit most as AI proliferates. That'll be part of a larger course catalog I'm building, so if you're interested, definitely make sure to keep an eye out in the next couple of months. But so, if China has already won tech, as Balaji says, the next logical question is, what does that actually mean? I mean, are we heading toward a world where there's one all-powerful model, maybe backed by China or by the US, that dominates everything? Or will we end up with many competing AGIs, spread across companies and countries? Dave Blunden leads toward the first scenario, winner take all, fueled by AI self-improvement, algorithmic breakthroughs, and massive data center spending. But Balaji pushes back, arguing that it's not that simple. Money alone doesn't guarantee breakthroughs, and AI might need physical embodiment to really advance to a point where we can call it AGI. Here's their back and forth. What didn't happen is a hard takeoff scenario of just building, summoning the demon and this one god, you know, and by the way, that was not, you know, you, you could have imagined someone had that. For example, the U.S. invented the nuclear weapon, the nuclear bomb, and they, for a period they had it before anybody else. And had the U.S. been like the Nazis or the communists, they would have conquered the whole world and blown it all up, right? But because it was a genuinely good actor, it didn't do that, it didn't use that power, you know, for, for, for as much evil as it could have. Um, but AI isn't like that. AI very rapidly, in, on a grand scheme of things, decentralizes you and faster than uh, than nuclear weapons. And I even think the analogy of nuclear weapons only can take you so far. Now you have, which by the way, which was counterintuitive because it's expensive to build these models. But now the Chinese open models, you know, uh, Kimi and Quen and DeepSeek and so on, as well as Llama, you know, which is Llama three was actually a really good thing that Facebook put out there. Llama four is not being as good, but I give a lot of props to Zuck for doing it in the first place. These are expensive things to put out there. Um, all of those, I mean, it's there's so many good AI models now, right? At a minimum, there's you know ChatGPT, obviously. There's Claude. There's Grok is pretty good, at least on the benchmarks. There's uh, Gemini. 
and uh, then there's Perplexi's models, and there's all the Chinese models, right? And there's just more every day. And um, so that's a polytheistic view. It's not first one to AGI wins, and it'll just out computer. But I think so the point first. I think the point you made, and I think an important point for people understand here, is these models are all leapfrogging each other, and no one is deviating by orders of magnitude. And so we're likely yes. to have at the end of this at least, you know, Dave, what's your guess? How many different, uh, you know, large scale frontier models are going to be globally, you know, five years from now or two well, years from I, now? Well, I think the natural da dynamic actually is one at the end of the day. Um, you but do. we're in this golden era right now of a few months, maybe a year, maybe two years where they're on the order of 10. Why? Because ASI dis depresses everybody else. Well, we haven't we haven't hit true self improvement. That started about a month ago. It'll go the next say four, five, six months, and so we'll know if there's a true singularity single winner about five or six months from now. So that's the big clash. Dave arguing we're heading toward one godlike AI, and very soon, due to recursive self improvement. And Balaji saying the future is going to be more fragmented, with many competing models, each with different strengths. Balaji actually doubles down later in the conversation, pointing out that we've already seen diminishing returns in the last year or so, even with billions poured into GPUs. And in his view, money alone won't guarantee breakthroughs. AI is decentralizing incredibly fast, as seen with open source, and progress may require something beyond just scaling like robotics and physical embodiment, which China is once again ahead on. Which leads us into another point he makes that really flips the whole script. Maybe the whole artificial intelligence framing is wrong. To Balaji, it's not artificial intelligence, it's amplified intelligence. Check this out. Right now, um, people think of AI as completely agentic, like it can do a task end-to-end -end completely by itself. For many tasks, it is really middle-to-middle. -middle. Now. I want to clarify, self-driving has gotten to the end-to-end -end point, right? It is now literally end-to-end. -end. It can pick you up and drop you off completely. It took 20 years since the DARPA Grand Challenge, but it was solvable. However, that took billions of dollars and, I don't know, certainly millions of miles driven and an enormous capex and a lot of time to get there. And there's a lot of actually warning and transition because the real world has friction, right? And so I am somewhere in between I don't think AI takes all the jobs right away because what happens right now is you find yourself, at least I find myself, the actual reality of AI, without naming them, for example, there's like a fair number of founders, for example, who will send over like AI slop slide decks. And I'll be like, it's like the new lorem ipsum, right? It's lorem AI ipsum, okay? AI PSUM, <laughs> right? It's like placeholder text. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's you know, the new midwit is a super intelligence. It's a super intelligence yet midwit, right? Me, because it's garbage in, garbage out. Like you get a midwit prompt in and you get midwit text out. That's what I mean by amplified intelligence, right? If you're really smart, yes, you can prompt it to figure out new corners of physics or math. And crucially, crucially, you can verify it by eye with your domain knowledge. Like I'm sure Terry Tao can search this and find interesting areas of math that he couldn't find before, but he is capable of looking at the stream of symbols coming back, parsing them and figuring out if it's just gibberish or not. Other people will look at, will talk to it, and it'll tell them it's discovering all this great physics and so on. But without actually being able to do the experiment or do the calculations and do the verification step, they're like convinced they've discovered some quantum mechanical, you know, insight. And right. it's just all, right. it's you bullshit, know, system bullshit all gibberish. Way. So, I mean, yeah. the, the point you made here that I think is very important for folks to hear is this means the smarter you are, the smarter the AI is working yes. with you. And it, other, the other half of this, which I keep on trying to shout from the rooftop, the rooftops is ask great questions. Yes. It, basically, if you're good at, I mean, AI means everybody's a CEO, everybody's a manager, right? It's a lot like interacting with an employee, especially a junior employee, and you have to check their work. You simply cannot shove it straight to prod. Fundamentally, that's the thing is, as a CEO, as a manager, you're interfacing with the market, especially as a CEO or the founder right? AI is not interfacing with the market. So it can throw slop over the end because it only has to satisfy you. It doesn't have to satisfy the unforgiving market. The mm -hmm. market will just set it to zero. So if AI is amplified intelligence, that means the smartest people are about to get exponentially smarter. But it also means something else that most people aren't ready for. Jobs are going to look completely different. Balaji argues AI won't just take your job. It'll let you do any job, at least to a baseline level. 
Your wingspan expands. A solo founder can do the work of a small company. A small company can do the work of a giant company. That's the upside. But at the same time, some professions will be eaten alive. Data entry, legal work, even parts of medicine. And he warns that the pushback won't just come from governments or regulators, but from white-collar workers themselves, potentially unionizing the way blue-collar workers did a century ago. Take a look which is AI doesn't take your job, it lets you do any job. I think that's a really important element here that uh, needs people need to understand and start to internalize. But why don't you give that's your right. favorite examples, yeah. So, so for example, um, you can get to a six or a seven on art, on graphic design. People who couldn't code can do prototypes of things. You can now do a prototype version in almost any area. So it's amazing for founders. It's amazing for self-directed people. It's amazing for people who have something in their mind's eye, but they just couldn't get it out, right? It's also amazing for people who have time on their hands, but not money, because they can prompt and prompt and prompt and prompt and get like a good image or a drawing for something if they lack the budget. But to polish it and to actually get it to like ship and production level currently, you, you need somebody who's an expert in the area to actually be able to debug the symbols, usually. Again, unless you're smart enough that you can teach yourself it, it, with it. So realizing that it actually more, you, you know the, the Heinlein quote about, uh, you know, a human being should be able to like yes. um, chop lumber. I, I'll, I'll get it wrong, but you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. He, he's, like, he's like, a human being should the, be able to chop things lumber, you should write be able a to sonnet. It, right? Yeah, exactly. Go, go, go. No, no, go on. It, I, I'm paraphrasing, chop lumber, write a sonnet, like make wine, um, sing a song, et cetera, et cetera. Gotta Specialization is for insects, right? He's basically talking about, right? So in an interesting sense, where I think AI does take us towards is a greater degree of robotic autarky. Smaller communities can be more self-sufficient. If you take, that's what I mean by the internet versus China, going back to that, like you can have a thousand million person network states where you it's, have it's, robots. It's, it's effectively decentralizing across the board. Large companies don't, I mean, large companies used to gather all the talent and, and parse them out a little bit at a time. Today, a team of one or a small group can do whatever's needed to. That's right. So it yeah. reverses the extreme specialization of the 20th yeah. century. Your wingspan increases, right? Yeah. There's lots of things you can do at an okay level right? You can learn what you don't know and so on. And so long as you're self-critical about it, knowing that the AI can be wrong, you can be wrong and so on and so forth, right? So that concept of versatility is there. With that said, for some kinds of areas that are genuinely just like data entry or, or something like that, you know, many kinds of, many kinds of midwit like jobs, right? Like, you know, if you're just like a lawyer who's using templates, if you're just a doctor who's reading from the book or what have you, AI yeah, can do it maybe with a higher error rate, actually in some cases with a lower error rate. In many cases, medical diagnosis AI has got a lower error rate. No, the numbers are stag staggeringly in favor of AI alone yes, without humans right. in a loop, right? That's right. So yeah. AI in medicine is much cheaper, orders of magnitude faster because you don't have to go to an appointment and so on. It's more personal. You can get not just a second opinion, a 20th opinion. So for certain areas, it's a complete transformation and it's a radical, radical, radical improvement. Medicine is one of them, law is one of them. Um, because you know, basically what you do is you use AI, you write all the contracts, and then you have the lawyers review and sign off and in the end, so you don't have to do the $1,000 an hour lawyer. right? Similarly with the doctors, you go and research everything with AI. It's like an ultimate search engine. And then you go and you get your prescription or whatever from the doctor after you've gone and done all your stuff. So they're the printout step, the final certification verification step. That's how people are using it in practice. But it doesn't mean that you have that MD or JD yet. That state certification is still a dangling thing. And there's gonna be enormous pressure from the AMA, the ABA and others to ban or limit the use of AI, kind of like unions, but white collar unions. So that's the paradox. AI will make individuals far more capable while at the same time hollowing out entire professions. And the people who feel safe today, lawyers, doctors, knowledge workers, may actually be the ones hit hardest. Meanwhile, the versatile, the adaptable, the ones willing to learn, they'll thrive. And that's really why this video is titled, The AI Future No One Is Ready For. Because whether it's collapsing institutions, China pulling ahead, one AI god, or many, or even your own career falling apart, the ground is shifting faster than anyone could process. Just like the internet changed everything, including the way we work, AI is about to do the same, only bigger and much faster.
So what do you guys think? Is AI going to empower us or replace us? And will there be one clear winner that goes on to dominate everyone or many? Drop a comment below. I'd love to hear your take. Anyways, that's all from me. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown. If you did, please make sure to drop a like. Hype up the video. Apparently, that's a new thing you can do now. And as always, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And I'll be catching you guys in the next one.